Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are with America of Jackson. This is really 1820s to 1848, part two of three. In part one, I went over antebellum slavery. Uh, I also talked about Jackson's administration. And uh, in this presentation, we're going to go through Indian removal and the Industrial Revolution, that is to say, the economy of the North. And this is predicated on steam, the perfection of the steam engine, and supplied to uh, both sea and land. And then we'll talk about the cost, which is on the backs of human beings. So there is a downside. In part three of three, we'll talk about manifest destiny and we'll uh, grow America. And that will end, grow America, and that will end with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago in 1848. So uh, this one should run about uh, just under two hours. I'll have to keep it under two hours. And then the last part, part three of three, should run about an hour and 20 minutes or so. And for those of you guys that are interested, that is about as much time as we would spend on it in a face-to-face -face class. So if you're watching this online, you're getting exactly what I would do on a face-to-face -face class. So with that lead-in, uh, let's go ahead and start talking about Indian removal. And that is a court case that starts out, it's a very complex court case, that starts out, and that is going to be Worcester versus Georgia. Indian removal begins with a very, very complex court case. And the court case is going to start out as Cherokee Nations versus Georgia. You can see it there on the left side of the slide. And then it will, um, it will change into Worcester versus Georgia. Now, again, this is a very complex court case uh, that has two parts. All of the information associated with this, all the underlying causes and uh, the outcome are all identical. But for technical reasons, which we'll get into in just a minute, the court case starts out as Cherokee Nations versus Georgia. So the setting of this uh, and the pattern, I guess, I'll, I'll use in going through this court case as I do with all my court cases. You're going to have the background. You'll have one side, the plaintiff side, and then the defendant side, then the outcome, and then the meaning to American history. And that's your outline right there in the center of the slide. So in your notes, you know, just write down background, leave three or four lines, then the plaintiff side, leave two or three lines, the defendant side, leave several lines, and just go on like that until we get uh, to the conclusion of the case, which again, it's very, very complex. Now, for those of you guys who are taking this course, please understand that there could be, and I say this guardedly, there could be a, uh, an essay question later on that talks about uh, the three court cases that we covered in this class. And you might be, could be, I don't know, you could be invited to pick one of those uh, court cases, which is either Marlboro versus Madison, McCullough versus uh, Maryland, or Worcester versus Georgia, and then tell me everything you know about it. But if you happen to see a question on that and you happen to choose it, you, ch you decide to choose that, please understand that what I give you in any one of these court cases is a very, very simplified version of the case. And I urge you in the strongest conceivable language, if you think you might be interested in doing one of these court cases as an essay, you have to do outside research. I will say that again. If you think that one of these court cases may be interesting to you as an essay question, just repeating back your notes will not work. You have to do outside research. So with that in mind, uh, let's start out then with Cherokee Nations versus Georgia. Now, another thing you need to know, kind of on deep background here, is that when we talk about Native American affairs, this is our one exception to that five-point cycle in dealing with Native Americans. This is an exception. So normally, we would talk about uh, encroachment and the Native American reaction, and then a war breaks out and the Native Americans are initially successful. Then the English, and in this case, the Americans, come back with teamwork and technology. Then they wipe out the Indians and take over the land. That is usually our pattern. But for reasons we're going to get into in a minute, this is an exception to that pattern. So with that in mind, let's start with the case, Cherokee Nations versus Georgia. And the background goes like this. We're on step one of this court case, the background. Now, the background is also very, very straightforward. The white man, obviously, wants the Native American land. That's what they always want. That's what they're always going for. They want the land. And in this case, their motive is like really, really strong. And it's very, very obvious, and it's twofold. Number one, finally, after all of this time, ladies and gentlemen, after all this time, gold is discovered. And it happens to be on Cherokee land in modern-day Georgia, 
upstate Georgia just as you're going into the Blue Ridge Mountains. So, gold is discovered on Cherokee land. And that means that the white man, he wants to stage a gold rush. They want the land really, really badly. But there's another element to this which is equally important. We're still in background now. And the white man wants the land, what's the, what they always want. But the Cherokees are trying to assimilate. I'll have that word spelled on a different slide on down the line here in just a minute. The Cherokee are trying to assimilate. So they have improved the land. They've uh, put cotton on the land, and as it turns out, and a lot of people don't want to hear about this, but the Cherokees are actually going to have slaves as well. And they put cotton on the land. They're trying to go the white man's way. More importantly, uh, or at least as importantly, they've also uh, put in a bunch of peach orchards. Now, that may sound like a common thing, but I want you guys to think of the investment in the land that a peach orchard requires. You have to put it in the trees. You have to keep it all weeded out, and then you've got to gather it all up in the, in the, in, in the season. And more importantly still, they're not using that for peaches to eat. Uh, peaches do not ship well, and they didn't have the shipping back in the 1820s, 1830s to ship peaches to market. People did eat peaches, just not in the way we would do it today. Instead, they're taking those peaches and turning it into an even more profitable product, and that's basically peach schnapps. They're turning it into an alcoholic product, and everybody was drinking that. So for uh, those reasons, this uh, agricultural improvement that the white man really does desire a lot, and because gold is discovered on their land, the white man wants this land really, really badly. Uh, the story goes, uh, just so you guys know, uh, that a traveling salesman was traveling through uh, that area, was going through that area trying to, trying to sell his stuff. And he went up to uh, this house and said, hey, you want to buy my stuff? And the Cherokees that were there they said, no, we're not interested in buying your stuff. And he said, this traveling salesman guy said, listen, well, I'm interested in buying something from you. That's a very pretty rock that you have propping open the door. Open the door, you're using it as a doorstop. And I'll give you 2 or $3 for it. And the Cherokee said, yeah, that is actually a very pretty rock. Sure, we'll take a couple of bucks for it because it's just a rock. Well, it turned out to be a big, giant lump of gold. And so... Even to this day, if you know where to go in Georgia, you can pan for gold and you'll get color. So there is gold in them, their hills. And again, the white man wanted it. As for the agricultural products, those speak for themselves. So we're still on background, but we're heading towards the plaintiff side. Now, Georgia wants to grab the land. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll cover this again in some greater detail. But they didn't want to, like, just wipe out the Native Americans and take it. So Georgia passes a law, and the law says, if you want to go into Cherokee land, you have to apply for a special license to go onto their land. Now, this is to keep people who are trying to help the Cherokee keep their land. It's to prevent them from doing that. Specifically, a guy named Samuel Worcester. Again, I'll have that on the next slide as well. Samuel Worcester was trying to go to the Cherokee lands. He was a publisher. Uh, he was a Christian missionary. And he's trying to like keep the land in the hands of the Cherokee Nation. So he's writing all sorts of essays and generating interest in the public mind. And he's trying to help them out. Well, Georgia doesn't like that, obviously. So they passed this law. Got to get a license to go to visit the Cherokee. And the trick was that they were never going to issue a license. They were not going to do that. So the Cherokee nations, they said, listen, this is a violation of our tribal rights. Now, to make a long story short, this is going to go to court. And that's what's important here. Again, I'll cover all this in greater detail in just a minute. But what's important here is that the Cherokee nation is trying to use the law to hold on to their land. They don't want to have a war. So the case is presented then to John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, this is in 1832. Uh, John Marshall's at the end of his career. He's going to die a couple of years later in 1835. And the um, court case goes to, Cherokee, goes to the Supreme Court as Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. So John Marshall sends the Cherokee Nation what's called an amicus brief. I'll have it spelled on the next slide. And it, the only thing that's important right now, 
He writes the Samicus brief back to the Cherokee Nation. says, Lot, I want to see the case. I do. But I can't because the Cherokee Nations and all Native American tribes are domestic dependent nations. And I have that listed under Cherokee Nations versus Georgia in bold, in quotes, underlined, different font, everything. Now what's important here, strong note, is that this gives us our constitutional definition of the Native American tribes to this day. This is their constitutional definition. That is to say they live in America, they function within the boundaries of the United States of America, but they are nations within a nation, a state within a state. That's the domestic de nations part. But they are uh, they are also dependent. In other words, they function at, within the United States. And so it's a, it's a very tricky constitutional definition. An analogy might go like this. Uh, let's say some uh, person from France came to Texas and he got mistreated somehow and he was unhappy and decided, listen, I'm going to go back to France and I'm really unhappy about my treatment in Texas. And so he sues, you know, the government of France, he gets the government of France involved and France tried to sue the state of Texas. Well, the nation of France cannot sue the state of Texas. So France might be able today to go to the international court and enter into a lawsuit, but usually, especially back in those days, France would go to the United States and the solution would be some sort of treaty or other. They'd work it out diplomatically from nation to nation. And so John Marshall is saying, you are the Cherokee nations and you're a domestic dependent nation. You do not have the right to sue the state of Georgia. You have to take this thing up diplomatically with the United States. Now, I want to be clear, this is good constitutional law because John Marshall went back to our British history and he said, here are all these treaties and the colonies were not able to make uh, deals with the Native Americans except in very minute cases. In the, big, in the macro, they had to be treaties between Parliament, the King, and these Native American tribes. And so here we are uh, in America in the 1830s, and America had taken over many of those treaties. They just said, you know, we'll, we'll just like make that treaty good that were left over from our British history. And then other treaties have come along, and it says that in our Constitution, Article 1, that it's only Congress, through treaties and through negotiations, that can deal with the Native Americans. The states can't do that, which is true to this day. So John Marshall put all that into this amicus brief, a friendly letter, and sent it to the Cherokee nations. And in the letter, he concluded by saying, listen, I really, really want to see this case. I want to see this case, but I can't in its current format. You have to change the case up. So with that in mind, let's go on to the next slide and let's just continue to flesh this very, very complex case out. Now, the ultimate element of this case is going to be the limitations on the power of the Supreme Court. And so I'll refer to what Andrew Jackson is doing in this in uh, kind of at the end of our, my presentation on this course, on this on this um, court case. So, again, the background of the case, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia. Georgia wants the land, there it is, gold. Georgia legislates to isolate or remove the Cherokees. Well, now let's stop right there and go over here to the right side of the slide. Now, the two governors that are involved in this are George Gilmer and Wilson Lumpkin. You don't really need them, and I only put them in there because if you look at the dates of which they were actually governors, it was Gilmer and then Lumpkin and then Gilmer again. So both these guys are involved. And But this is the strong that I want you guys to take. These guys kept saying, look, we're not monsters. We're not evil men. We do not want to destroy the Cherokee Nation. We've had a more or less positive relationship to with them, but that relationship is ending. And so they looked back towards history for a solution. And they said publicly and repeatedly, usually the solution is wipe out the Native Americans and we don't want that. So they hit upon an idea, and this is the strong limit that I want you to take. Their idea was to peacefully remove the Native Americans to the other side of the Mississippi River. They said, listen, if we get them on the other side of the Mississippi River, it's going to take many, many decades for America, the United States, to 
have to interact with these Native Americans again. If we can safely remove them, we will save those lives, which was true. To be clear, this is like really, it's, it's a bad idea, but the alternative was worse. If the Native Americans stayed on that land in Georgia, they were all going to get killed. And that's what Lumpkin and Gilmer both said. So the state is trying to form this Native American policy, safely remove the Native Americans to the other side of the Mississippi River. Well, on the Cherokee Nation side, there you see him, Samuel Worcester. He's a missionary. There were several others involved in this. But he's the one that I want you guys to focus on here. And he is saying, listen, I'm down there helping the Cherokees. I'm writing all these essays. I'm generating public interest in this. And so the first thing Georgia had to do was isolate the Cherokee. So they passed this law I discussed earlier on saying, listen, you can't go onto Cherokee land unless you get a license from the state of Georgia and we're not going to give out any license. And that's the way they were going to isolate the Cherokee nations. And then finally get them, you know, put them under pressure, the Cherokees, and get them to remove, get them to agree to removal. Samuel Worsell violated this law. He's trying to generate a lawsuit. He violated the law, but Georgia wouldn't put up with any nonsense. They arrested him and they put him in prison. Now, if you can imagine being in prison as a Christian missionary for four years at hard labor, they were sending a message here. Under any circumstances, uh, Samuel Worcester gets out of prison, and as a citizen of the United States, he can enter into a lawsuit against Georgia. So the case was presented as Cherokee Nation from versus Georgia. There is an amicus brief. I have it spelled up there. They get this amicus brief back from John Marshall, and so the court case becomes Worcester versus Georgia. Samuel Worcester can, as a citizen of the United States, he was from Connecticut, I believe, he can sue Georgia over this law. You know, he had evidently broken the law, and they threw him in jail for it, but he's saying, look, the underlying law is unconstitutional, which it was. He had a case. So the whole thing goes back up to the Supreme Court as Worcester v. Georgia. The background of these two cases is identical. The background of Cherokee Nations is identical, is identical to Worcester versus Georgia. So the, the, the case is identical. Now, Worcester versus Georgia, John Marshall wanted to see it, and he did. And again, strong note here. So this is the outcome of the case. You've got the background. You have the plaintiff side. You have the defendant side. Uh, Georgia is the defendant. They're saying, listen, we should be able to make this law to isolate the Cherokee Nation because that's state's rights. Worcester said that underlying law was unconstitutional, as it turns out it was. And so he sued because he didn't feel like he should uh, he should be able to go anywhere in America he wants to go. So it goes to the Supreme Court. Strong note here. The Cherokee Nations, that is to say Samuel Worcester, won the case. They won. John Marshall said and, and implied conclusively Listen, looking back at all of our history on this, Georgia had no right to write that law. And by treaty, the Cherokee nations have that land, and it's theirs by treaty. Strong note here, only the United States federal government can have interactions with the Native Americans. Only the federal government and the federal government only. That's an Article 1, Article 2, and Article 6. Only the federal government can make treaties that deal with the Native Americans. They're the only political body that can do that. The states cannot. So the Cherokee nations won. Well, strong note here. Uh, that's the outcome of the case. But that's not the that's not going to be the end of the case. So let's go on to the next slide and you know take a look at what actually does happen. Now, in this slide, I want to kind of give you just a little bit more background on the Cherokee Nations, just very briefly here. The Cherokee Nation was trying to assimilate. I have it spelled up there. They're trying to assimilate. Assimilate means go the white man's way. And on the right side of the slide, let's just take a look at this. There's John Ross. He was the principal chief of the Cherokee Nations. And uh, if you say to yourself, well, he doesn't really look Cherokee. Okay, his mother was 100% Cherokee. But his father was an Irishman. 
And his father had like done a whole lot of things for the tribe and he'd been adopted into the tribe. That was possible under Cherokee law. And uh, so John Ross rose up to be the chief of the Cherokee Nation, the principal chief. Uh, down below that, let's take a look at, um, I'm sorry, let's go uh, immediately kind of clockwise. There's John Ross's house. And as it turns out, that house is actually still standing. And so you can see that it's not, you know, he's not living in a teepee. He's not living in a wigwam or something like that. He's living in a, in a house, a home. And he had a lot of land. And he had cotton and peach orchards. He had improved the land. He had slaves like anybody else would in that era at that time in that location. So again, this is another sign that they're trying to fit in. They're trying to go the white man's way. They're trying to like work this thing out. But the people of Georgia aren't having it. Continue on clockwise. There's Major Ridge, another principal Cherokee chief. And Major Ridge, that he's not, that's not a military rank. His name was Major. And he's part of a faction. Please write this down. There were factions within the Cherokee Nation. And he's one of the factions that said, no, we're going to hold on to the land. We're going to fight all these court battles. But another uh, faction emerged, and that's uh, kind of like led by Elias Boudinot. Elias Boudinot, and you can see from the way he's dressed, uh, the way his hair is done, you can see that uh, he has a feather pen in his hand, which indicated that he was literate. You know, he wrote letters, and he was, you know, he had command of the English language. And so did Major Ridge. They both did. All three of these guys did. And so again, they're trying to go the white man's way. But Elias Boudinot says, "Listen, just use your God-given common sense. This isn't going to work." Georgia's going to get the land. The United States is going to get, get the land. So we may as well make an advantage to ourselves. Strong note here. The reason why these are such bitter factions is that the Cherokees had adopted that law that I talked about earlier on when we talked about uh, Take Em Say's Rebellion, that it was illegal to sell or give land to the white man. It's illegal under Cherokee law to give or sell land to the white man. It's a death sentence. Now, Elias Boudinot stuck to his guns, and he said, well, listen, we're going to get removed, and they did. And he did, in fact, profit from that. He sold out his land. He made a deal, and he took money for the land and everything else. Well, when they finally did arrive in Oklahoma, as it turns out, the tribe hunted him down, and they hanged him. So he paid the ultimate price for selling land to the white man. In other words, this law saying do not sell or give land to the white man, that was a real thing. Now, that cartoon uh, on the lower left, I want to draw your attention to this, and I, I, it kind of it looks a little bit fuzzy to me on the, as I'm going over the presentation here. Hopefully you can see it okay. But there's a lot going on in the slide uh, on, on that cartoon. And again, cartoons are about uh, the people at the time knew what was going on. That's what it indicates. So kind of uh, in the lower right, you can see somebody giving this uh, Native American who's pinned down giving him a haircut. And then as you go across the bottom of the slide, you see all these people like holding him down. Well, this is a sort of a, 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 a reference to um, Jonathan Swift's novel, uh, um, Gulliver's Travels. And there is this big giant being held down by lots and lots of little, little people, little putians. Yes? Well, so there he's being all hemmed down and pulled down and like yanked down and staked down and tied down. So he's trapped. There's no place for him to go. If you look carefully on his legs, he it talks about the railroads. The railroads are one the land, too. And they want the Cherokee Nation driven off. You keep going around to the top. At the very top, there's a cemetery. And so um, the implication there is that that's where we, you know, we get rid of the Native Americans. We just bury the bodies. Just get rid of them. And then ignore them. It all goes away once we kill them all. And so, this is a, in other words, people knew what was going on. Uh, last but not least, if you go right back to uh, the Cherokees, the guy, the, his head, you'll see that um, there's some people boring a hole with a big giant auger drill into his head. And these are all the Christians. And the Christian community is getting into their heads and like teaching them the Christian ways and telling them to like, you know, be, be Americans. Last but not least, and I really want to point this out because it's hard to see, sitting on the Native American's nose is a very early version of Uncle Sam. So Uncle Sam is sitting there right on top of the whole thing, viewing the whole scene and not doing a thing to help. So what we get out of this cartoon is that people knew what was going on at the time. They knew that this terrible business was going on with the Cherokee. 
But under any uh, under any circumstances, the outcome of Worcester versus Georgia, and I have it there in red, the Cherokee nations win. Georgia had no right to do what they did. They couldn't do that. But as it turns out, uh, Andrew Jackson wasn't having any of it. So let's see how Andrew Jackson approaches this problem. Now, Jackson and Worcester versus Georgia. So Jackson, he was kind of trapped. But unfortunately, Jackson played both sides. He kept telling the Cherokee Nation, we're going to help you, we're going to help you, we're not going to let anybody hurt you, everything's going to be fine, you're going to be able to keep your land, everything's going to be cool. And that was a lie, that was unfortunate, and it's, it's a lie. Because he was telling Georgia, yeah, we're going to get rid of the Native Americans, we're going to get rid of them, we're going to get rid of them, we're going to get rid of them. So, Jackson is trying to uh, placate both sides, he's trying to like help both sides out. But he was going to sell out the Native Americans, and that's the way it worked. For those of you guys that are doing uh, these uh, essay response papers, one of them in there talks about Jackson and in removal. And it makes it very clear that Jackson was being duplicitous here. He's crooked. It's wrong. He was, he was deceiving the Cherokee Nation, John Ross. But he has to, I have to say, Jackson is in a tight spot. Jackson must do the will of the American people. He has to. And so he's trying to string the, the Cherokee Nation along, but he says, listen, we've got to get rid of them. We've got to get them out of this, the country. Now, again, Jackson takes Georgia side in that, and he does say this. We're going to try and save those lives because if they aren't removed, they're going to be wiped out, which was true. So we have here a dilemma that, as it turns out, there is sort of a bright spot, but that's kind of at the very end of my presentation on this issue. Under any circumstances, this is what Jackson does, and it's crooked, oh, it's dirty business. Uh, it's easy to point out that all of our dealings with the Native Americans are just dirty, dirty business, and this is one of the bad ones. So Jackson is going to wait until John Ross is in Washington, D.C., fighting a court battle to keep the land. John Ross is in Washington, D.C., and he's fighting a court battle, and he fought court battles all the way to the end of his life. He's going to die in the 1870s in Washington, trying to like put in another lawsuit to get the land back. He dedicated his entire life to trying to get the land back for the Cherokee Nation. And as it turns out, there are Cherokees that live in that part of Georgia today. So in a way, he was kind of successful. But Jackson waited until John Ross was up there in Washington, D.C., and he said, okay, he sent the State Department, strong note, he sent the State Department down to the Cherokee Nations. And he said, listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to have the big giant barbecue, invite everybody there, try to get everybody all gathered up, and then literally roll out the barrel. And what you're going to do is you're going to get out barrels and barrels and barrels of whiskey, beer, alcohol, and you get the Native Americans all tanked up and drunk, and then put a treaty on them. Now, there are several treaties, but there are only two that I want you to know about. The Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek in 1831 and the Treaty of New Dakota in 1835. And what these treaties are, they're duplicitous, ladies and gentlemen. They're, it's a trick. And there's a copy of the treaty. There's page one of the treaty right there. And you may feel free to read it at your leisure. But what these treaties basically say is, hey, we're going to be friendly. It's going to be wonderful and generous. And we're going to help you guys out. And there's going to be perpetual friendship and, and, and amicus and amity between the United States and the Cherokee Nation forever and ever and ever. But then if you get down to down like paragraph 6 or paragraph 10 or whatever it is, it says, by the way, you're going to lose your land. And so sure enough, the State Department sent representatives down there, got everybody good and drunk, and said, yeah, this treaty says we're just going to be friends. That's all the treaty says. Oh, and then they whisper, by the way, you're going to lose your land. Well, these drunken Native Americans, many of them who could not read this, they simply signed or made their mark. And Boudinot did, and, and Major Ridge, he said no, he held back. But many, many, many others claiming to be chiefs or claiming to be important people in the Cherokee Nation, they signed or made their mark. So the State Department goes back to Washington, D.C. and says, hey, you guys gave up your land. Here's the treaties right here. Now, John Ross, when he found out about this, he was livid. And he said, I did not sign that. Therefore, the treaty is no good. It's no good at all. That's not going to work. I didn't sign that treaty, so it's invalid. Well, the State Department said, I'm sorry, it is valid, and now you guys are going to lose your land. So it was a trick. 
It was a trick from the start. On the other hand, strong note now, and this is really, really bad, and I know it. It was constitutional. These Native Americans had signed, many, many of them. They could have be shown to have spoken for a great many Cherokee nations. And, and so the State Department said this, the treaty signed, and it's a valid treaty. And you guys are going to lose your land. You signed saying so. And that's what happened. It was a trick. So Jass is going to famously say, in conclusion here on the court case, Jass is going to famously say, Mr. Marshall has made his ruling. Now let him enforce it. And so strong note here, this is the final you know, outcome of the case and, and the real meaning to American history. What Worcester versus Georgia really shows is the limitations of the Supreme Court. In other words, the Supreme Court depends entirely upon the executive to uphold the law. And Jackson had seen this court case, and he said, okay, well, we're supposed to uphold the law and let the Native Americans have their land. But instead, he went through this other thing, this other avenue, which is constitutional, got them to sign some crazy treaty while they were inebriated, and said, see, you're going to lose your land anyway. The Supreme Court has no enforcement capability. They depend entirely upon the executive. And the executive in this case had to do the will of the American people. And so Jackson just sent the State Department down there, made him sign a stinker of a treaty, and got the land anyway. Under the law, under Cherokee Nation versus Georgia and Worcester versus Georgia, the Cherokees should be able to keep that land. But, unfortunately, the State Department made that treaty, made these treaties stick. So with that in mind, this will lead immediately to an event called the Trail of Tears, which will be the next, uh, it'll be the next slide, but let me set it up here. So the Army gets this job to remove the Native Americans, and the Army did not like it at all. Their senior general saw this. Uh, you know, Jackson said, you guys got to, it's up to you, it's your responsibility to remove these Native Americans. And the senior general resigned immediately. He said, that's not national defense, it's not our job. Well, that then leads us to Winfield Scott. And I want to write a strong note on Winfield Scott. We're going to run into him again later. He's a major figure in American history. We're going to run into him again. Now, Winfield Scott was a senior general in the Army. He insisted that the Army be professional. He always pushed towards a professional, trained military force. But our Army at the time was really, really small. Less than 20,000 men total in the entire United States Army were less than 20,000 men. Winfield Scott was instrumental in starting West Point Military Academy in an attempt to like uh, improve professionalism. And that will work. That's going to pay off big time later on down the line, especially when we get to the Civil War, the Mexican War of 1848 and the Civil War. So Winfield Scott got this mission to remove these Native Americans, and he knew it was a stinker too, and he said so many, many times. He said, this is a bad job for us. But in a whole bunch of letters to different uh, people within the military, within the Army, he said, we got the stinker of a mission, strong note here, but we're going to do this in a professional, upright, honest way. We're going to help these Native Americans as much as we can. The job itself is a stinker. It's a, it's a crap mission. It really is bad. But we're not going to get a bad reputation over it. Now, that's not the way that history has, has recorded this. History gives the Army a bad name on this. And that's unfortunate. But it does lead to the Trail of Tears. So Winfield Scott is trying to negotiate really, really briefly on this, because I want to go on, on the next slide. Winfield Scott goes to John Ross. He goes to the other principal chiefs, and he says, listen, you guys got to go. Pack up and get ready to go. And John Ross, I have to say, he played this really, really well. Strong note. John Ross said, listen, it's, it's fall, and we're just now trying to harvest all of our, all of our crops. We've got a harvest going on. You can't take us now. We'll lose all this money. An entire year's work will be gone. And so Winfield Scott says, well, okay, but get ready to go. As soon as the harvest is over with, you guys got to go. And John Ross comes back to him and said, well, the harvest is done. But it's winter now, and you can't dare remove us in the winter. We'll all die. We can't do that. And so Winfield Scott, like, rolls his eyes and said, okay, but in the spring, you got to go. Well, the spring comes along, and John Ross says, listen, we've sent out scouts to the land where we're supposed to go, and we've got to wait for them to get back. And furthermore, we've replanted. A lot of our guys have replanted the land. 
And so Winfield Scott says, well, he rolls his eyes. He says, okay, well, you guys got to, you know, in the fall, you got to go. So the scouts come back and they say, you know, they say what they say. They actually said really positive things about uh, eastern Oklahoma, which, as it turns out, um, is basically like large parts of Georgia. More about that in a minute. Anyway, the winter came along again, or the, the fall came along. They harvested, told Winfield Scott they couldn't go. Another winter came along, and so finally we're all the way out uh, in 18, 1840, 1841, 1842. And finally Winfield Scott said, listen, enough playing around, enough stalling. What John Ross was trying to do was to stall, get some court cases going, and maybe hold on to the land. But Winfield Scott finally had to put his foot down and tell the Native Americans they got to go. Which leads us to the next slide. Now this event is called the Trail of Tears. This event is called the Trail of Tears. And there's only a few things that I want you guys to get out of this. First, they did remove in the winter. Winfield Scott said, listen, you guys got to go. We've got other things we've got to do. We can't hold fire on this any longer. Uh, the state of Georgia and the people of Georgia are getting really, really anxious about this. And you, there's going to be a war. You're going to get killed. So we've got to do this. John Ross, for reasons of his own, he caved in. And so they started removing. But they did remove over the winter. And it was a very bitter, very cold winter. More importantly, and this is really important. I've done a lot of research on this. And I want you guys to write down a strong note. When they had to travel on this Trail of Tears, I want you guys to be clear. It's not any kind of a highway system. Only rarely were there any kind of roads. For almost 600 miles, they had to bust jungle. This is primeval forest. It's actually called the Georgian uh, uh, Forest, the Georgian uh, Ecological Group. And it goes all the way from Georgia all the way to eastern to central Oklahoma. And so... There's this one great, big, gigantic, enormous forest that goes through that whole area. And there were no roads, or very few roads. And what roads there were were really, really primitive. So you see all these Native Americans having to bust jungle. Now, occasionally, the Cherokee would take roads that go through more settled up areas. But some of the observers said that this was, like, really, really horrible as well. Uh, one of the officers named Edward Dees, uh, he left a series of diaries about this. Another officer uh, named uh, Scott, he left a series of diaries about this. And they said they'd get on one of these toll roads, escorting these Native Americans out to Oklahoma. And the people that were operating the toll roads, they were saying, well, okay, well, it had been like, you know, five cents for a wagon. But when they saw the Native Americans come along, they said, okay, well, now it's five dollars for a wagon. Or these Native Americans would go through some town or something and try and buy some supplies, the price would skyrocket. Or, you know, um, bandits and thieves would be chasing after them, swearing up and down a stack of Bibles that some Native American or other had done a deal while they were passing through town. And now these white men, these vultures, as Edward Dees called them, these vultures, these thieves and bandits, they wanted a lawsuit to try and, you know, fleece these Native Americans. Lieutenant Scott talked about how... Um, his band, that who's escorting out there to the West, um, they got cholera. And so he contracted cholera as well. Well, he went through the night trying to look in the, all over the place for a doctor. And he finally got to somebody's house and he said, listen, where's the doctor at? Where is a doctor around here? And they said, well, we know where the doctor's at. But, you know, you've got to stay outside. The settler said that. You've got to stay outside. Otherwise, you're going to, like, infect the whole family, kill everybody. So the settler went out and found the doctor and, you know, got help for these poor people. So I'm not trying to whitewash the Army's role here. They did have to get the Native Americans loaded up. They burned all of their property behind them. Uh, there's a reason for that. And they had to get them out to the West. The reason why the property was burned, and everybody says this, is because in Georgia, here's all these squatters. Here's all these banditos. And vultures, that's exactly what Edward Dees called them. And they're waiting for the Native Americans to go out so they can just move in and take over all their stuff. And these Native Americans knew what was happening. They were so furious. They said, well, rather than let it fall into the hands of these squatters and banditos and just these, these thieves, we'll just burn it to the ground, which is what happened. 
And so the story in our American mythology is that the army burned the Native Americans out. Well, they certainly did burn everything out, but it's because the Native Americans said, burn it to the ground, let it to fall in, rather than let it fall into the hands of these other people. And that's, that's perfectly understandable. Under any circumstances, there's story after story after story I can tell you that are really, really genuinely unfortunate. But I do have some statistics. When we're talking about Indian removal of the five civilized tribes, which are the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole, I have them over there on that list on the left. We're talking about around 80,000 people. Numbers are hard to get because they change constantly. In other words, the Native Americans had to do their, their roles, and sometimes these roles alter a little bit. So, but it was around 80,000 people. And a study after study, it shows conclusively, 80,000 people go out there, and about 20% of them are going to die. But if you dig into that 20%, I'm sorry to say this because it's horrible, but it's the exact population group, it's the exact statistical group you would anticipate who would be most vulnerable on a trip like this, six or seven hundred miles, busting jungle through the winter. It's the very old and the very young. But ladies and gentlemen, let me point this out. 80% made it. 80% made it. And everybody says, listen, had they stayed in Georgia, Alabama, and large parts of Mississippi and Tennessee, had they stayed there, they would have all been wiped out. And a case can be made to show that. Because that had always been the way it was prior to this event in American history. There's not many Algonquins. There's not many Algonquins. There's not many Mohawks left. There's not many uh, Iroquois left. The entire Iroquois nation wiped out. You know, they're all dead. So history shows that the white man was perfectly capable of wiping them all out. But in this particular case, they were moved to the other side of the Mississippi into modern-day Oklahoma, and 80% of them made it. 80% made it. So if you're trying to make the case that the Army in this particular case, who knew they had a bad job, were actually out to try and kill the Native Americans, none of them would have made it. There's plenty of opportunity to get them out in the wilderness and just let, let them die, or get them out in the middle of the wilderness and just shoot them. But instead, the Army actually did a good job, as good as they could under the circumstances in the winter, in the late 1830s, early 1840s, in removing these end of unfortunate individuals. The Trail of Tears is aptly named, but 80% made it. Now, with that in mind, I want to go a little bit more macro and talk about those tribes that are up there on the map in the middle, up there in the red. And it's the Ottawa, the uh, Winnebago's, the Potawatomi's, uh, the Sac and Fox, uh, the Sioux and the Ojibwa, they were removed at the same time. Strong note here. Now, they were removed much more violently. They were chased out. Basically, it's William Henry Harrison who was looking to use that as a success in a bid for the presidency, which worked. In other words, the president who has to do all this is going to be Martin Van Buren. By the time the Trail of Tears event took place, there had been enough stalling and enough uh, hesitation on the part of John Ross making them wait that Jackson was out of office. So this stinker of uh, an event in American history landed in Martin Van Buren's lap. And he didn't like it at all, but he did it. And I'm sorry to say that those tribes up there in the red, they were removed more forcibly. William and Henry Harrison, he uses the army, he forces them out, he provokes a war. And all these Native Americans are removed forcibly. And so, you know, the Sac and Fox, which you can see, they had a huge giant uh, territory that was theirs. But they're crammed into a tiny little territory, and there's a tiny little Sac and Fox nation today. The Sioux Nation moved more further out onto the prairie. Uh, the Ojibwas and the Ottawas, they're going to move up into Canada. They're going to get out that way. Uh, the Potawatomis, they go on down to Oklahoma. The Winnebagos, they kind of stay put in Indiana. But there's like, I don't know, there's like 50 of them today. And so they're like, they, they like suffered a lot. So the Trail of Tears, a really, really, really bad situation. Again, uh, the Cherokee Nation tried to use legal means to hold on to their land. That did not ultimately work. And uh, a lot of these Native Americans are going to be removed. The Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, and Seminole will be removed peacefully. And they're going to wind up in Oklahoma, and 80% of them made it. 
all those nation, Native American tribes in the north, uh, most of them, they're just going to be chased out the hard way. And uh, many of them will, in fact, perish. So with that, uh, let's, let's move on and let's start talking about the economy of the north. Let's talk about the economy of the north. Okay, we're switching gears here and we're talking about the northern economy. Now, the southern economy was based on an agriculturally based economy, cotton, tobacco, uh, corn to a certain degree, but especially cotton and tobacco. That were their cash crops. But the north is going to maintain, in broad terms, an industrial based economy. And this is really a part of the uh, first industrial revolution. So the background of this event, strong note now, is the first industrial revolution really 1800 to 18 teens and it has to do with the perfection of the steam engine the steam engine had been invented in the mid 1700s but it was really cantankerous it didn't work many of the times nobody knew exactly what to do with this invention this development uh, but right around the turn of the century especially a guy named james watts as in watts of electricity that guy he developed he perfected the steam engine made it actually reliable and useful and other people, I guess in American history, the most uh, common name that comes to mind is Robert Fulton. Uh, he'll apply the steam engine to a boat. Now, ironically, he tried to sell the steam engine boat idea to Napoleon Bonaparte. That's how early this uh, perfection of the steam engine was in the, in the 19th century. And Napoleon Bonaparte kind of questioned him about it. And he said, you know, a boat with no sails. And Napoleon Bonaparte said, that's, you know, you're just trying to, this is quack, this is some kind of science fiction, it's not science fact. And so he rejected Robert Fulton. And Robert Fulton comes back with this idea to America, and he starts a series of ferry services between Long Island and New Jersey. And um, that will lead to a court case itself, and we're not going to talk about that. But uh, imagine how his history would have changed had Napoleon been able to get a boat that did not depend upon the wind, because he desperately wanted to invade England. Under any circumstances, it is the steam engine that begins to trans transform this northern economy. But our first example of this is the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal. Now, this is all an economic argument, so I'm going to use a lot of economic language here. Our demand is for fast, efficient transportation. Let me draw your attention to the map. Now, as you can imagine, off the map to the left are the other Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, uh, Lake Superior, they're off there to the left. And there's a lot of Americans out into that area, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. And they have products that they want to send to market. Plus they demand products that are being manufactured in the east and they demand that in the Great Lakes region. Well, the most efficient way to do that is by boat. You have all this, you know, you have all this tremendous, the Great Lakes there, you have all this tremendous waterways, and the fastest, most efficient way to do that is by boat. But when you get to the eastern end of Lake Erie, you can see that kind of channel there, and that's where Niagara Falls is at. Well, right there at Buffalo, New York, that's where Niagara Falls is at. So, if you want to, like, move from Lake Erie to New York, you have to go through Lake Ontario and then out through a series of rapids and waterfalls to the St. Lawrence Seaway, then on out towards Nova Scotia in Canada, and then down the Atlantic coast back to New York City. That is inefficient. But if you can get out of the water, if you can like have a channel going from Lake Erie over to the Hudson River and then down to New York City, that cuts off thousands of miles of distance and the necessity of going through a lot of other channels and around waterfalls and all those other difficulties. And so the supply is a canal between the Great Lakes and the Hudson River to New York. And that's what I have up there. So the Erie Canal is going to be this tremendous uh, infrastructure. And the idea here is the, the demand was for fast, efficient transportation. The supply was a canal between Lake Erie, starting at Buffalo, North Tonawanda, to be specific, all the way over to Troy, and then you catch the Hudson River and go down to New York City. And so material could get to New York City from the Great Lakes region, 
and then materials being manufactured in New York to get it out into the Great Lakes region. And so this was like a really uh, a, a high priority construction, the Erie Canal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care a bit about the Erie Canal. As it turns out, I don't care a bit about the Erie Canal. I care about the issue behind the issue. So let's go on to the next slide and figure out exactly what that is. This is an economic argument, so please make sure you like pay attention to this economic language. So the Erie Canal began in 1817. And I want you guys to be thinking about the issue behind the issue. And here it is. When we talk about building this canal, and we'll take a look at the images here in just a second, I want you guys to be thinking about what it actually takes to build this canal. Now, much of the canal was actually along riverways, rivers that were already existing. However, even those had to be cleared out. Big giant boulders, rapids, they had to be cleared out. If there was a waterfall, you had to get around the waterfall. You couldn't go over it, obviously. So you had to get around it. You had to build infrastructure for that. So a lot of the waterways was already there. But from Lake Erie, you have to go up in elevation and go over the Poconos and the Catskill Mountains and then back down again to the Hudson River. Then there are several lakes and a lot of like waterfalls and shallow waterways along the Hudson River until you get to New York. Well, you had to like work that out as well. So think of the issue behind the issue. How many architects, how many surveyors, how many engineers, how much move, earth moving equipment did it take to actually put this canal in? So to like plan it all out, you gotta have surveyors. They gotta go out there and say, okay, we can put in, uh, you know, here's the river. But here are the problem spots within the river, and they survey that all out. And they can work out how the canal needs to go. Then to change in elevation, you have to have locks. And lock is in that picture in the upper uh, right. That is a lock. In other words, it's like an elevator for a boat. That guy's like leaning up against the gate. They open up the gate. The boat goes in. The water goes out. It's drained out into a special like reservoir. Then the boat goes out at the bottom and goes on down the river, as you can see on down the background. Well, a boat that's going up gets into the lock. The water comes out of that special reservoir into the lock, and the boat is then therefore lifted up. Then gates open on this side, which is what you're looking at right there, and the boat floats free. Very, very efficient. And so you can use efficient bulk supplies through this, this canal. So you have to have surveyors going out there. Then you have to have a lot of architects. They got to be able to like plan out and then build the locks. You're also going to have viaducts and aqueducts, which is what you see down there in the lower right. And so these are where those boats are going to go in and out of towns and cities. There may be something going on with the river. It may be too shallow or there may be rapids there or there might be a waterfall nearby. So you're going to build an aqueduct or a viaduct to bring the boats inside the city. Well, you're going to have to have engineers to like plan that out. Then there's going to be, have to be earth moving equipment. How many shovels, wheelbarrows, horse teams, how much stuff is going to go into actually building this? Then finally you get the canal and you're going to have canal boats, which is what you see there in both those pictures, uh, kind of like in the middle of the slide and on the uh, lower right. Those are canal boats. Observe they don't have engines and they don't have sails. Their motive force is to go by horse. The horse is going to drag them along. So how, many, how much wood goes in one of those boats? Well, that means a lot of lumberjacks out there in the forest. And they chop down the trees, and the trees go to a sawmill. So how many sawmills? The sawmill turns the tree into lumber, and it gets dried out. And then you have to have special purpose carpenters called shipwrights to turn that lumber into a boat. It's got to be watertight. It's got to be of a certain size and dimensions. You know, if it's too big, it won't fit into the locks. If it's too small, it's not efficient. So it has to be exactly the right size. And so you have to have all kinds of iron and, you know, nails for the wood. you got to be able to bend the wood just exactly right. You have to have everything necessary to make a canal boat. What do all of those people do with the money they make? At this, pay, at this point, I'm jumping up and down. I'm spitting into the microphone. My glasses are flown off. What do all those people do with the money they make? That is the issue behind the issue. They spend that money. 
The carpenters are going to go out there and they're going to say, listen, I need new saws. I need new saw blades. I need new axes and stuff. And somebody's going to be there to meet that demand. They're going to supply equipment to the carpenters, the surveyor. He says, listen, I need equipment to like make all the maps, to do all the precision measurements necessary to put in the canal. Uh, special purpose equipment like a, a theodolite. That's that you know, kind of tripod thing. You see them on the side of the road using a theodolite even today. And it's a special purpose piece of equipment to do the survey work. And it's just all of these things that people need to actually do the canal. What do they do with the money they make? They spend it. And somebody is there to meet their demand. And what do those people do with the money they make? They spend it. And so what happens to the economy? It goes up. The economy intensifies. There's more money going from place to place to place. And the economy gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So I have down there, think. Again, I've mentioned this a million times in class. What I, the only thing I want you guys to do in this class is think. Would road building increase or decrease due to canals? This is counterintuitive. In other words, boat um, road building would increase due to canals because you have to have roads for you to bring product down to the canal. Then it gets loaded onto a boat. Let's say you had a wheat field near Syracuse, New York, and you've harvested your wheat and you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bushels of wheat. Well, your target market is one of these big cities, presumably New York City, where there's like lots and lots of people and they all want bread. Well, if you were in Syracuse, New York, and you try to load this wheat up into your wagon and take it all the way to New York City, the wheat would spoil. It would be no good at all. It would leak out of your wagon. Bad things would happen. It's not going to work. It's not efficient. But you can load that same amount of wheat up into a wagon, take it three or four miles, maybe five or six miles down to the canal, put it onto a canal barge that you see in this picture, and then it gets floated down to New York. It's down there in a couple of days. And this is very, very efficient. I don't care. How many surveyors does it take to make a road? How many guys leveling out the land? How many guys making all the ditches so the road stays drained? How many guys are going to like, how many people will it take to make that road? And what do all they do with the money they make? They all spend it. And somebody's there to meet their demand. And what do they do with the money they make? They spend it. And so think, does this increase or decrease economic activity? Economic activity goes up exponentially. That's what a manufacturing economy always does for you. This is straightforward Adam Smith supply and demand. It's straightforward Keynesian economics. John, long before John Menard Keynes. Keynesian economics works. You put in infrastructure, people get involved in these products, in these, in these construction projects, and they make money. Then they spend that money, and so the economy goes up every time. It works every time. Now, I spent a lot of time on the Erie Canal as to demonstrate the issue behind the issue, which I have in there in bold and underlined and, and, and a different font. But I do want to pick up the pace. So with this idea of the economic meaning of the Erie Canal, let's proceed then, and we're going to talk about another product that's going on at the same time. Now, another product that's happening at the same time is whaling. I know it's terrible. I got it. We're going to go out there and harpoon these defenseless animals and like slaughter them in vast numbers. Well, then what's the demand? Now, usually when I'm in class, I try to like, you know, get people to think about this. But here on this online thing, it's kind of difficult to get you guys to do that because I can't get any feedback from you. Well, the demand is for lanterns. That is to say light at night. Now, you guys have no idea about this. You have no way of knowing it. But as it turns out, whale oil will burn really, really brightly. It's just the nature of the oil itself. It burns very, very bright. Furthermore, whale oil is a very clean oil once it is like filtered and processed. And so it will take a scent. That is to say you can put in some kind of artificial scent and it'll come out smelling like, I don't know, cedar. Or it'll come out smelling like a, a, a clover or camphor oil or something like that. You put a scent in it and then it's pleasant to breathe. It doesn't smell like a dead fish. So it's very, very bright. And you can, it'll carry a scent. And that makes it very, very 
uh, much in demand. Now, the lanterns we're talking about are like these storm lanterns that you see in antique stores, or you know, you may you should be familiar with that. It has a kind of a a, a tank at the bottom, and you pour the oil into there, and then it has this little wick mechanism, and then it has this glass chimney coming up. Well, the, everybody had to have that. So again, who is your target market? Everybody is your target market. Your target market is everyone. And then the second part of this is, strong note, what do you do with the product? You're burning it. So you need a constant, perpetual, never-ending supply of this product, whale oil. You need it like all the time. So your target market is everyone, and everybody's burning it, so you need more and more all the time. Now, sidebar, the alternative is candles. And candles were almost invariably made out of beeswax at the time. And beeswax will only hold together for like twice. In other words, you can make a candle out of it, then melt it down, gather up the wax, and turn it into a candle one more time. After that, the beeswax loses its chemical cohesion, and it won't turn into wax anymore. Furthermore, bees are, beeswax is actually, it turns out, it's to be very, very expensive. It's inefficient. But whale oil is very efficient. Once you go out there and murder those defenseless animals. So the supply for whale oil is actually whaling, which is terrible, I know. But I want you guys to be thinking about the issue behind the issue, which is why I spent so much time on it talking about the Erie Canal. Take a look at that picture in the uh, on the upper left. You have to have a special purpose ship for this, and it's called a whale ship, a whaling ship. Uh, there's actually one that's still in existence called the Charles W. Morgan. It's in New Bedford up in Massachusetts, and it still swims. It was launched in the 1840s. Think how much wood goes into one of those big, giant ships. Think of the mast, the spars. That's those, those um, pieces of wood, those big, giant sticks of wood that go crossways. Think of all the wood that goes into that thing. Then many of these ships are going to have a copper-plated hull. So they're going to have big, giant sheets of car of uh, um copper as big as like a big giant desk or something and you nail that on there we'll talk more about that later so you have all this wood so how many lumberjacks had to go off into the woods into the forest and chop down a tree then again how many guys are going to saw that tree up into usable lumber how many shipwrights are going to turn it into a ship how much iron goes into one of these ships take a look at that ship right in the middle of that photograph it's got its anchor sitting out there these anchors weigh like many many tons and it's nothing but iron so how many guys are down the mine getting out that damn taconite to get it turned into iron? Other guys are making coal so you can melt down the taconite, which is um, metal in the ground, this metal ore. And then they got to forge that thing to a great big giant anchor. And every one of those ships has to have five or six anchors. They have two main anchors and a whole bunch of what they call sheet anchors. Well, then you've got to be able to transport the oil, and that means barrels, which is what you see in the foreground, which is what makes this such a useful image as a teaching tool. Now, barrel makers are a special purpose kind of carpenter. They're called coopers. If anybody's named Cooper anywhere in your family lineage, then they probably were barrel makers back in the day. Now, going out, the ship would carry the coop, he would carry all the barrel staves, the sticks that you make the barrel out of, they would be all broken down. And then there'd be a bunch of barrel hoops because it's easy to transport them that way. Furthermore, the crew has to have a whole bunch of, sh uh, a whole bunch of food for this, this journey. About eight months going, about a year on station out in the Pacific, because the Atlantic uh, Ocean had been fished clear of all these, these poor defenseless a animals, these whales. So you're out in the Pacific doing this, and then you've got to go about, I don't know, five or six months coming back. So they have to have all sorts of food products. They have to have all the things necessary to keep them alive. Think of all the sails that go into these things, all made out of cotton. Huge, vast numbers of, of, of amount of sails. Think of all the rope. And what do all those people do with the money they make? They spend it. Then finally, you go out there and murder all these defenseless animals, come back, and you've got to move all of the whale oil. Clearly, they've unloaded all that whale oil and it's sitting on the docks. Well, it's not doing any good there. So it has to be put on different transportation devices and moved out to the frontier, moved down to the south moved inland, moved to all the cities. And then it's got to be distributed. And you just this is this huge gigantic industry that's going on around whaling. So you're again, uh, that's on your bullet points over there. How many ships? The supply for the whaling fleet. How many barrels? Shipping to the target market, which is everyone. How many people are put to work? 
thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people are put to work. And what do they all do with the money they make? They spend it. So what happens to the economy? Now, strong note here. All this is happening at the same time as the Erie Canal, which, as it turns out, was fairly localized. But this whaling business is going on at the same time. Hundreds and hundreds of ships going out there all the time. Yes? So the economy is going absolute nuts. Well, we're not done with this idea yet. Let's move on to the next slide. Now, here we're talking about the railroads. And again, I have it in blue over there. Think of the issue behind the issue. Now, the railroad, uh, the, the steam locomotive, was actually developed by an ancestor of mine, George Stevenson. And he developed the rocket in 1819. Strong note here. The controlling interest on a steam locomotive is precision machining. That is the controlling interest, precision machining. In other words, the controlling interest on the Erie Canal was the canal boats and efficient transportation by water, the canal itself. When we talked about whaling, the controlling interest was getting the whale oil to the people out there, get them all barreled up and get the whale oil out to the individual. That was your product. Here, the controlling interest on steam locomotives is precision engineering. In other words, your village blacksmith cannot make the cylinders and the valves perfect enough so that they will control the steam in the way that needs to be done. So you have to have precision machining. Furthermore, the steam locomotive is made out of a lot of iron and a lot of copper and brass, a lot of copper and brass, and a lot of iron. So George Stevenson is going to develop the steam locomotive, 1819. The problem in England was, very briefly, the problem in England was, and I've talked about this before, every stitch of land, every square centimeter of land in England was spoken for by someone. And no one, no one, no one wanted to give up land in order they could put the railroad through. Nobody trusted this invention. They all thought it was like, you know, something crazy that wasn't going to work. So the railroads are going to be big later on in England. But George Stevenson is going to make the locomotive and immediately is going to come to America. Because we have no trouble with land. We just knock some Native American on the head and steal his land. So the rocket uh, developed in 1819. But take a look at uh, the, that list of dates that I have up there, kind of the top of the slide. In 1827, less than 10 years later, we have our first railroad chartered in America. The B&O, the Baltimore and Orange. In other words, it originates in Baltimore, Maryland, and it goes through Washington, D.C., down to Alexandria, Virginia, which is in Orange County. And so, in Orange County, Virginia. So, the railroad is chartered, and then they can start putting in the railroad. More about that in a second. 1830, the first passenger service, three years later. 1833, President Jackson, he's going to be out there uh, riding around on the railroads, and it was an amazing development. 1840, take a look at that, 2,800 miles of tracks. In other words, just under, uh, what is it, what would it be, 13 years from the start, we've got 2,800 miles of track. 1850, 9,000. It's more than tripled. Then in 1860, just 10 years later, 30,000. It's more than tripled again. Now, think, think, think. All everyone you guys do in this class is think. That in 1860, 30,000 miles of track. But that 60,000 miles of rail, there are two rails on each track. So let's think of the issue behind the issue then. How much iron goes into one of these locomotives? How much iron, how much steel goes into the actual track? How many surveyors to go out there and put the railroad track in? That's that picture on the lower left. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, this is just a sidebar. The tires... On the railroad track, on the railroad engine, are smooth. And the rail is smooth. The tires are smooth and the rail is smooth. So railroad locomotives do not like hills and they sure don't like valleys. They don't like that. They want a steady level elevation. They don't like hills and they don't like valleys. So all of your surveyors have to like find a way. If they run into a mountain or a hill or something, they've either got to burn their way through the mountain or the hill tunnel or like carve out a big giant pathway through the hill or they got to survey a way around it 
Well, if you have a hill on one side, you're going to have a valley on the other. And that means you've got to build a trestle, a big giant railroad bridge on the other side. And so it's tunnels and then bridges and tunnels and bridges and tunnels and bridges. Alternatively, your railroad has to like snake across the country. It has to weave back and forth, avoiding hills and valleys. So that requires surveyors. It requires engineers. It requires all the guys that you see out there working. they got to lay down these railroad ties. Those are invariably made out of wood. So you're going to have more lumberjacks out there cutting down the forest. Then they carve them up into those wood, those big giant tree trunk woods, those sleepers they call them, those railroad ties, and then you lay down the track. How many people got put back to work? Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people got put to work. And what they do with the money they made, they spend it. Now your ultimate demand, ladies and gentlemen, is fast, efficient transportation on land. Fast, efficient transportation by sea. Well, the boats, we'll get to that in a minute. But this is fast, efficient transportation where the rivers are not, where there's no rivers. Now, the alternative had been going by stagecoach, but that's very inefficient. You can only travel as fast as the horse can go, which, as it turns out, is not very fast. And you have to have, it's, it's just very uncomfortable. It takes a long time to travel. But if you've got a railroad going from place to place to place, you can rock along at a whole 20, 25 miles an hour. Woohoo! And because it is a machine, it could go a lot farther and a lot faster and more efficiently than horses. But you have to put in the infrastructure. So how many people got put back to work? Thousands, thousands, thousands. At the same time that we're building the Erie Canal, and at the same time we're doing all this whaling. So what happens to the macro economy? The economy is going off like a Roman candle. It's going crazy. Well, let's continue on with this. Uh, there are other issues that are happening at the same time. What we're talking about here are clipper ships. Now, this is a specific type of ship, and it is entirely an American development, entirely an American development. In other words, canal building, that went way back, that went all the way back to the Egyptians. Um, the railroad or the steam locomotive that have been developed in England, as I pointed out. But the clipper ship is entirely an American development. William Webb and Donald McKay, they're on the right side of your slide. And these are two individuals whose names should be written in letters of gold. Because they made this development called a clipper ship. Now, very briefly on this, because this is not a class on naval architecture. Since time immemorial, if you look down on the bow of a ship, for millennia, three, four, five thousand years, if you look down the bow of a ship, it was teardrop shape. And that flows through the water fairly efficiently. You know, naval architects going back to Egyptian times, they recognize that. And so the front end of a ship was shaped like a teardrop. But here we are in the 1830s, really. Along comes William Webb and then his like best student, his best uh, protege, Donald McKay. They said, no, instead of making it teardrop shape, do what the English will later call build the ship inside out and make it knife shape, sort of like a V, where the bottom end of the V, the, 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 the leading edge of the V, that is a knife shape. And instead of the water flowing around the ship, the ship cuts th through the water. And so the speed of the ship will increase dramatically. I mentioned before that it's going to take eight or nine months for one of these whaling ships to get out to the Pacific Ocean because they have that traditional design. But our demand here is fast oceanic travel, and the supply is the clipper ship. It is a specific type of ship developed by William Webb and Donald McKay. Now, because they have this night-shaped bow, they also have another development. Strong note here. Uh, in the 1700s, the mid-1700s, the British had discovered that if you take big, giant copper sheets, maybe the size of a desk, and nail those copper sheets to the hull of the ship, then that will cut down on a specific type of marine parasite that grows on the hull of the ship, barnacles and seaweed, but especially a marine parasite called a boring worm, a teredo worm, that can actually eat through the wood and get into the hull of the ship. Well, you don't want to have these worms getting onto your ship and then eating through the wood. They eat wood. 
and then knocking a hole in your ship and sinking you. You don't want that. But if you put these copper sheets on there, the copper, I don't know how else to put it, kind of tastes bad. Take an actual penny and put it in your mouth one of these days. Wash it off, obviously, and then put it in your mouth, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So they put copper sheets on the bottoms of these ships, and then these huge giant sail surfaces, and then they had this nice shaped bow. And so we're talking about ships that would go super, super fast for a wind-blown ship. So think this all the way through. We're talking about fast and efficient travel by ocean. They have a huge sail surface. And so they're, in other words, your fuel is the wind. Once you build a ship, traveling is really, really expensive because the wind is free. And you have this sharp bow that cuts through the water and you have a copper plated hull that'll like travel through the water really, really fast. It's really smooth as you can imagine. And so you can just roar along. Strong note here, this is not travel just to go back and forth across the Atlantic, which is what people did a lot to get back and forth to Europe. Our target is really China. We've been trying to get to China this whole time. I've talked about that many, many, many times. We're still trying to get to China. And so one of these ships, the Flying Cloud, as it turns out, I have it on the slide there, went from Canton, which is in China. It's on the coast of China, all the way to Virginia, and they made that in 95 days. Understand they had to go diagonally across the Pacific. The Panama Canal was not there. They had to go diagonally across the Pacific, around the south coast of South America, and then all the way up the Atlantic Ocean, the South Atlantic, and, and uh, across the equator, and to the Virginia coast and the North Atlantic. And they did that in 95 days. The Flying Cloud and the Sea Witch, Young America, they all did this. They were reeling off four or 500 nautical miles in a 24-hour period. 400 miles in a 24-hour period. That, they could do that. Understand these ships are sailing night and day. They never let up. So they're able to like reel off thousands and thousands of miles really, really, really quickly. As long as they don't run into any kind of crazy storm or hit something, then they're going to make it to wherever they need to go to really, really quick. And they're going to be able to carry a huge amount of cargo. Strong note here. The clipper ships were really, many of these clipper ships were built for the California trade. In 1849, as you well know, there's going to be a gold rush in California. And the only way to get from the East Coast to the West Coast back in those days is to go by ship. So we talk about the Comet, Staghound, Storm King, Sovereign of the Seas, Flying Cloud, Sea Witch, Young America, Great Republic, and hundreds of others. We're talking about many of these ships are built for the California trade. That's exactly what Storm King, Staghound, and Comet, that's all they did. Back and forth from the East Coast to the West Coast, going around South America. And the average is about 100 days. Many of them are going to do it. I think the, the record is 89 days, 13 hours, and 30 minutes, something like that. But many of them are going to do it in right around 100 days. 120 days is actually considered a long journey from the East Coast around South America to the West Coast. That's amazing. I don't care. I don't even care a little bit. Think of the issue behind the issue. How many people making cotton is it going to take, turning cotton into cloth, is it going to take to make all those sales? How many guys up there in the woods chopping down trees, turning that into lumber, and then giving it over to shipwrights so they can turn it into that ship? How many guys building, um, you know, cargo boxes? How many guys making copper sheets and then nailing that to the hull? How many designers and architects? How many people are put to work making these ships? Not one or two or three, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. All at the same time that we need ships for whaling. We need all this iron and, and steel and, and, and uh, metal, brass and, and copper for the railroad industry. We're trying to put all kinds of boats and everything out there on the Erie Canal. We, we, all this is going on at the same time. How many people got put back to work? So what happens to the economy? It goes up. It goes crazy. The economy is going absolutely nuts. However, there is a downside. And for that, we go to the next slide. There is a downside. Now, the downside goes like this, ladies and gentlemen. We're in the Industrial Revolution. The first Industrial Revolution really goes from circa 1810, 1815, right there in the 1810s, up to about 1850. For the purpose of this class, 18 teens, 
1850. That's the first Industrial Revolution. And it's really based on the perfection of the steam engine. Strong note here. It's done on the backs of human beings. And our thesis on this is the law has not caught up with industrialization. Our thesis statement on the Industrial Revolution is the law has not caught up with industrialization. Uh, several really good historians have written about this. Linda Colley talks about this. Um, Richard White talks about this in his books. Uh, there's half a dozen others that talk about this Industrial Revolution. And at one remove, that is to say following behind the Industrial Revolution, is the law catching up with industrialization. So let's talk about what this means. The law has not caught up with industrialization. Up until this point in world civilization, the law had always been based upon an agricultural economy, an economy that, that was all about agriculture as its foundation. And so as it turns out, the land is not going to go anywhere. Therefore, the farmer is not going to go anywhere. Gilgamesh, five and a half thousand years ago, he would have understood this. The land's not going to go anywhere, and so the farmer's not going to go anywhere. He's tied to the land. And so you can go to that farmer and say, listen, I'm actually the landowner and you're just here farming it. And so based on a handshake, I'm going to say that at the end, when the harvest comes in, I'm going to take this amount and you keep the rest. And that actually incentivizes the farmer to farm really, really hard because he knows he's got to pay for that land, a species of rent, but then any overproduction he gets to keep. And the landowner just takes his share of the land and he goes off and pays taxes and does all sorts of other things, lives in a great big giant castle, whatever he's doing. But he can afford to make that deal on a handshake because the farmer's not going anywhere and the land's not going to go anywhere. So just in terms of practical practicality, what if just at harvest time, oh, there's a big giant hailstorm, a big giant weather event that ruins the crop? You know, a plague of locusts comes in and eats everything. We can go back to that farmer and say, listen, I understand everything's wiped out. I got it. Fine. So next year, I'm going to take a percentage more of your product. But then this year, you're going to, you know, I'm not going to take anything at all because you've suffered this terrible uh, um, weather related catastrophe. And so you can make that deal. But in an industrial based economy, everything has to be part of a contract. Again, Linda Colley talks about this a lot. Um, Langford talks about this a lot in uh, his book, uh, Polite and Commercial People. Uh, there's, there's all these people that are talking about this, and they all say the same thing. The 1700s is a time economically where the law is altering. It goes from an agriculture-based uh, 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 law into an industrial-based law. But in America, we have a lot of lag time. So what does all this mean? It means that there's no labor restrictions, and that means children are trapped in the labor force. So with that, let's do a little bit of image analysis. Uh, let's go to the lower left. Take a look at that kid that's standing on that machine. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the machine is functioning. It's not a still machine. If you take a look at that wheel, you'll see the wheel is slightly blurred, and that means that it was moving when the photograph was taken. But again, look at that kid. He can't be more than six or seven years old. And he's standing up on that machine doing whatever it is that he's doing. It's a spinning machine, as it turns out. And he's like getting things like, you know, he's doing what he needs to do. Well, he has no shoes on. He's, you know, just this little bitty kid. If he should slip, there's no guard on that belt. There's no guard on that wheel. There's no cutoff switch. If he goes into that machine, he's just dead. Nobody's watching. There's no adult supervision at all. Take a look at those young ladies in that photograph above. And, you know, that poor girl right there in the middle, she is mad as hell. She did not want to have her photograph taken. But God bless that little girl there on the right side of the, that picture. She's just, uh, she's just adorable. You just want to pat her. It took me a long time to realize this. This is a very, actually a very famous photograph. But the two girls on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, uh, they're twins. They're not dressed identically, but they are twins. Now, don't be fooled about that young lady with the darker hair. She's very, very young, but she's exhausted, and it shows on her face. But my question to all you guys, in terms of analysis, how old are those young, those young ladies? How old are they? 
They, they, you can't go more than 11 or 12 years old. You just can't. They're little kids, and they are in the workplace. And that photograph there on the right, the upper right, again, uh, you have one young lady who's kind of the adult supervision, but everybody else in that picture in this big giant uh, spinning this loom, making cloth, turning uh, cotton into cloth, they're little kids. The last photograph down in the lower right, uh, those are young men. They've got candles on their heads uh, in that little holder because they are down in the mines. They're digging out that coal or they're digging out that taconite because the Industrial Revolution demands that. Well, labor force, you know, we're just devouring the labor force. So children get trapped into this. And because they're in the labor force at a very, very young age, literacy rates plummet. In other words, these children are not learning how to read or write. They're not learning how to do any sort of math at all. They're not learning arithmetic. And so generation after generation after generation, they're going to be trapped in this. They'll grow up, promptly die, probably most of them. But if they have kids, their kids have got to go right back into the mill. And they're trapped. In other words, mom and dad grew up illiterate because they were in the mill. They were in the factory. And then their kids are going to grow up illiterate as well. Now, that should ring a bell for you guys. I mentioned that this was going to be a pattern way back when we were talking about colonial education. Uh, during the colonial times, you had to read that Bible. And that was motivating everybody to, to go to school, learn how to read and write. But here, the Industrial Revolution is just demanding so many people go into the workforce that education falls by the wayside. And so literacy rates plummet. They just go down to the bottom. They're just like... Literacy rates go down to like 10 or 12 percent throughout the entire 1800s, the time frame we're talking about. Now, last but not least on this, I want to draw your attention to the Sadler Report, and that's named after Michael Thomas Sadler. His picture is down at the bottom. Now, I don't want you guys to be deceived. Michael Thomas Sadler, he was uh, in the British government. He was in the English Parliament. What makes Michael Sadler useful to us here? is that England was going through the same problem that America was going, but about really 10 years earlier. Their Industrial Revolution, right around 1800, and then by the 1830s, 1840s, they completed the, the first Industrial Revolution. There will be another one later on in the century. But Michael Sadler, as a member of Parliament, uh, he saw what the problem was. He recognized this. Everybody knows about it, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But the solution was to find out, to discover exactly what the problem was. Once you know what the problem is, this is a life lesson, then the solution usually presents itself. So to nail down exactly what the problem was, Michael Sadler commissioned a parliamentary report called the Sadler Report. And I want you guys to write a strong note on that. Sidebar, if you ever get some assignment, especially in the English department or someplace else, we have to do a strong essay. The Sadler Report is really, really a good resource because it's almost all online. And it has a sociological message to it and, you know, a political message. It has an economic message. <coughs> so the Sadler Report is really, really a great resource for any of you that need to do some kind of other uh, essay. So the Sadler Report, they're going to send out a bunch of... Um, uh, uh, researchers and these researchers are going to go out there and they're going to talk to the kids and they're going to say to the kids and you'll see this in the Saddle Report listen would you rather be in school or would you rather be at work well this is counterintuitive but the kids would almost always say I would rather be at work the follow up question is why would you rather be at work than rather be in school school is so much easier than this this is like terrible and the kids would always say because my family is starving now imagine, if you will, the psychological burden that's put on a small kid to know that they have to go to work because their tiny little income keeps the family from starving to death. Furthermore, they'd ask these little kids, well, is there any violence here? And they would say, yeah, I get beat all the time. Well, why do you get beat? Well, it's because I'm falling asleep. I'm exhausted. And they would ask the, the, their, like, immediate supervisor, back in those days they called them the minder, they would ask the minder, listen, why do you beat those kids? 
And I said, to keep him awake. I don't want him to get hurt, which is a horrible, I mean, what an answer. Yeah, I'm beating the crap out of them so they'll stay awake. An alternative to beating them was called dunking. There'd be a tank of water over there somewhere, and you take the kid by the feet and dunk him head first right in this bucket of cold water, this big giant barrel of cold water, and then send him back to work, and that will wake him up. And so they go talk to mom and dad. Why do you send your kids out to work? Well, because we're starving and we need that income. I'm working. Dad is working. And these kids, as soon as they're working age and get into the factory, we put them in the factory because we're starving. We need that work. We need that income. So it's devastating. One of these mothers talked about, as I recall, that um, they were asking them, the, the research was asking, well, you know, when the kid comes home, do you, like, get them cleaned up and this and that and the other? And the mom would say, yes, I try. But as soon as they get home, I try to feed them a good meal. But they'll fall asleep with food in their mouth. And I'll try to get them, like, cleaned up, but they fall asleep. And I just have to wash them while they're asleep. And then I put them in bed. And then a few hours later, they get up. And I have to try and feed them again. But very often, they'll fall asleep with food in their mouth. So how exhausted is the little kid that they're falling? They can't stay awake at all. And they're working six days a week. Finally, in the settler report, these researchers would go talk to the factory manager. And this is the key, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going somewhere with this. They talk to the factory manager and they say, why do you do this? Why are you doing it like this? And the factory managers would always say, because I need to remain competitive. If I'm not competitive, then the factory would close and everybody would be out of work. And it's very competitive to keep my labor costs low, so I hire children because I can pay them less. And all the other factory managers are doing the same thing. All of the other factories were doing the same thing. And that was the key to the problem. The Sadler, Michael Sadler could then go back and say, listen, we need a blanket law that will cause all of the factories to have to get rid of children at the same time so that no factory had an advantage, a labor advantage, over another factory. And in England, that led to the labor law of 1833. Strong note now. So England solved the problem. But in America, we will not have a solution until the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. So this dynamic that you see here, these children in the workforce being exploited and just crushed, more about that in the next slide, that will be a dynamic, that will be a facet of American labor all the way until the 1890s, almost to the 20th century. So we have two or three generations of, three or four generations really, of children there that are absolutely going to be illiterate. And this is like really, really devastating to um, American culture. It's horrifying. But the law in England caught up in 1833 on this issue. The law in America will not catch up until really the 20th century, 1890, 1895. Let's go on to the next slide and really um, show you guys kind of what's going on here. Now, I couldn't resist. I just wanted you to have a little bit more image analysis. Uh, in other words, you guys know how I feel about that. And it's not one or two or three pictures of kids in the workforce. It's thousands of them. There are hundreds of them. This is horrifying. We're getting into the age of uh, photography, uh, 1850s, 1860s, and one of the things that people wanted to have photographed a lot is children in the workforce because people, especially the middle class, wanted that to end. So you can take a look at the photograph in the upper left. That's usually where I start. Uh, take a look at those guys. There's an older fellow sort of on the very left side of the slide, but take a look at those young guys. Uh, the, uh, the oldest can't be more than 12 or 13 years old. These are little kids. They're in the third or fourth grade, all right? That's how old these kids are. Same thing, skip over the cartoon. We'll come back to that in a minute. Over there, up in the mill. In other words, those kids on the left, they were down in the mine shaft. Those kids on the right, they're up in the mill. The, 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 the product, the ore, uh, coal in this case, has come up out of there. It needs to be sorted, and that's what those guys are doing. So in both of those uh, cases, those guys are breathing coal dust, like all the time. On an 8-hour, 10-hour, 12-hour shift, they're breathing coal dust. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, coal dust is crystalline in its form. 
So if you breathe that stuff in, it's a sort of a crystal. And as you breathe in and out, those crystal, uh, that, that, that coal dust is cutting your lungs up. So all those children that you see there in those photographs, they're going to get emphysema or another condition known as black lung. It's called black lung for a reason. You breathe in that coal dust, you turn your lung black. And that drawing in the middle, on the lower middle there, that's what those guys are doing actually down in the mine shaft. And so they're loading up these ore carts and they have to push them the hard way or hook them up to a small horse and get the ore out of there. And then somebody's at the face of the mine shaft just hammering out this coal with a hammer and a chisel. It's, you know, it's back-breaking hard work. Uh, in the lower left, you see some young lady there. Uh, doctors were actually consulted in America and in England to see what effect this had on young ladies. And they said their health was really, really detrimentally affected because they were on their feet and working in this back-breaking labor their whole lives. Their health was really badly damaged. Now, very briefly, the two cartoons. Let's take a look at the one in the center top. And this is, it's, I know it's kind of hard to make out, but the spider there has the phrase child labor written on it. And then the web, if you look around the web, it talks about profit and poverty and luxury and indifference and greed. Those are the strings on the web. And then obviously, there's this child caught in this web. In the lower right, child labor exploiter. Here's this guy dressed up as some Roman senator going around in a, a, a chariot there being pulled by these little kids. And you see money bags and dollar signs all over the place. So what's important here, as it always is with these cartoons, this shows that people knew what was going on at the time. But in America, it just takes forever and ever and ever to change the, oil, to change the law to get the law to catch up with industrialization. So with that in mind, uh, let's go on to the next slide and talk about uh, attempts to actually um, to, to resolve this situation, to like make it better, to improve the situation. So what we're talking about here is the Walton system. Now your book will talk about this in a slightly different way, but it's the Walton system nevertheless. And this was an attempt by the people of the time to try to apply Christian virtue to this terrible, terrible situation in the factories. Now, I'm sorry to say this, but it's perfectly true. When Christianity comes into competition with money, money almost always wins. Christianity, sometimes it wins, but mostly money wins. And that's, I'm sorry to say, what's going to happen here. So again, these Christians are going to come along, various Christian organizations are going to come along, and they're going to say, listen, let's try to make this better. Now, strong note here, because it sounds like a multiple choice question to me later on. The target market here is young women. In other words, um, our society said, look, and we really, really don't want young women to be badly exploited here. There was this fear that young women are going to get into the system and they're going to turn into basically prostitutes. And it's really, really bad. So the target market is young women. Give women that second, third, fourth daughter a fighting economic chance. In any one of these big families, which every family was like really, uh, they had a lot of kids back in those days, obviously. Well, the oldest son, he's going to inherit if there's anything to inherit. He's going to inherit. The oldest daughter, maybe they can make an arranged marriage, come up with some kind of a dowry. They can do something for the oldest daughter. But I've mentioned this before, that second, third, fourth daughter, there's like no chance at all. They're going to, bad things are going to happen. So the target market here is young women. And the system, the idea, was to make a sort of a dormitory situation at the actual factory. Have this dormitory. They can go there and live. They don't have to walk a long ways home uh, where it might be dangerous or difficult to do in the winter, difficult to do in the summer. But they can live in this dormitory right there on the factory grounds. And they'll have a room. You know, they may have to share a room with one or two other young ladies. They'll have a little pot belly stove. There'll be a cafeteria there. And they'll have wholesome food. So they can get up in the morning, go to work, get off at night. As soon as they get off, you know, they can go to their room, get cleaned up, and get some sleep. Much more efficient. 
And then after working in this factory for three, four, five years, two, three, four, five years, they'll have a little bit of a nest egg. They'll have a little bit of money built up. And then that makes them a very attractive young lady as a bride because they have a little bit of an income. They have a little bit of money. But as time goes on, reality sets in. And the Waltham system is not going to work because pretty soon the factory owner will say, well, listen, I'm going to get rid of those pot belly stubs. That's costing me too much money. That's not efficient. And I'm going to tell these young ladies, hey, just bring in an extra blanket or something. If it gets cold outside, just have an extra blanket. And the food in the cafeteria, it was wholesome and there was a lot of it. So there's going to be a whole lot less of it. It's basically boiled water. And they're going to tell these young ladies, listen, if you want better food, you know, send a message back to mom and dad. Maybe they can bring something. Or take what little money you do make and, and spend it on actual food for yourself. And where you did have a dormitory room where you're only with one or two girls, now you're with four or five girls, six or seven. And so, over time, the reality sets in and you're just exploiting the labor force. And so the Waltham system just becomes another factory. They're just another factory. It's just that your labor force happens to be right there handy where you can exploit them all the more efficiently. So the situation is bad. So let me kind of wrap this up real quick. The situation is bad in the North in terms of the labor force, in the macro. Now in the South, we have slave labor. And that's like really, really, really bad. But I want to be clear on something. In terms of labor in America, in the time frame we're talking about, the 1820s all the way up to the 1850s, 1860s, Labor in the North was no better. It's no utopia. If you're African American and you're going to try and escape from slavery, God bless them, I want them to do, be able to do that. But you wind up somewhere in the North, your labor situation has not changed. It's just as brutal and difficult. But then you have the added part of basically prejudice. Because people in the North hated people, hated black people as bad as people in the South did. There was no escape from that. So in our American mythology, we want all these slaves to escape to the north and everything's going to be some utopia. That is not the case. Labor was just as harsh in the north as it was in the south. To be clear, you are an economic slave. Now, you can't be beaten, really. You can't be, like, whipped. And you can't be bought or sold. And that's really the only technological, the only technical difference between a poor labor in the north and a slave labor in the south. You cannot be bought or sold. But in terms of the economic impact, it's basically the same. The laboring poor, especially the Irish, especially after the 1830s, 1840s, their situation is just, just as desperate as it was for a slave in the South. They were free to be sure, but they were economic slaves. And in terms of practicality, there's just not much difference. So the North was no sort of labor utopia. It simply was not. Now, there is one phrase I want to draw your attention to. It's called free labor. Your book will talk about that a lot. Uh, historical uh, um, essays will talk about free labor a lot. Free labor is not no-cost labor. Free labor is non-slave labor. That's the difference right there. Free labor is non-slave labor. And the big debate in America at the time, heading up to the Civil War, was that free labor, non-slave labor, was just so much better. Okay, fine, I'm, I'm good with that. Slavery is evil. But when we talk about the difference between free labor and slave labor, for the worker, laboring poor, they had it bad in the North. I can promise you that. They did have it bad. It was no utopia. It's not some place where everything's going to be you know, rainbows and, and sparkles, and it's, it's not going to be lovely. It's not. It's ugly. All right? So that uh, then uh, leads us to our transition slide. Let's go to the next slide, and let me introduce uh, really part three of Jacksonian America. So part three, go to part three of three. Uh, we've talked about antebellum slavery. We've talked about Indian removal. We talked about the Industrial Revolution, steam by sea and land, and we've talked about the cost. That's what I just got done talking about on the backs of human beings. What we'll talk about really on the last part, uh, Jacksonian America, part three of three, is we've got to grow America. We've got to exhibit manifest destiny. We'll talk a little bit about the growth of cities, but mostly it's going to be about manifest destiny. 
We've got to grow America from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. And that's really what part three, which will run about, I don't know, maybe about an hour, hour and 20 minutes. That's what it's going to run into. So please go on to part three of uh, three parts, and I will uh, see you then. By the way, when we get to done with Manifest Destiny, uh, that's, when I'll, that's our landmark in this class. That's when we'll stop and have a test. So please proceed to uh, Jacksonian America, 1820 to 1850, part three of three.